Welcome to Executive Leaders Radio, your spot in the corner office, the radio show where executives share their secrets to success. Executive Leaders Radio. You're listening to Executive Leaders Radio. This is your host, Herb Cohen, with my co-host, John and Lane, and Mark Knight, Frank, Drew Hanlon, Hanlon, Frank Hennessy, Premier Planning, and Matthew Shapiro from Obermeyer. And we have a great lineup guest for you on our show today. Matthew, will you please give us the rundown? I'd love to, Herb. We're going to start off with Maureen Cumstone, who's the entrepreneur in residence at the U Imagine Center at Ursinus College. Then we have Michael Ayello, the CEO and managing partner at Century Business Consulting. We have Carol Ben Maimon, the president and CEO of Larimer Therapeutics. And we're going to wrap it up with David Cole, the president and CEO of the Science History. <clears throat> Well, let's get to know our first guest, Maureen Cumstone, entrepreneur in residence, U Imagine Center at uh, Ursinus College. Maureen, what is the U Imagine Center at Ursinus College? The U Imagine Center is uh, the Center for Entrepreneurship Education and programs that inspire students to take ideas and move them forward. Hmm. Where are you from originally? Orland, Pennsylvania, right outside of Philadelphia. Uh huh. How many brothers and sisters, and where are you in the pecking order? Oldest of uh, two, one sister. Mm -hmm. You're the oldest of two. And how young were you when you started making money? I started around 11. Mm -hmm. uh, my parents. Mm -hmm. Please. My parents uh, bought a business uh, in Flower Town, Pennsylvania, and uh, a year what into that. What uh, kind of business? Restaurants. Uh huh. So you went to work in your parents' restaurant when you were 11 years old. Uh huh. When you started working there, what did they ask you to do? Everything. Uh huh. And um, how long did you work in this restaurant, starting at I the worked, age of 11? I worked there through high school, went off to college, uh, had a professional career, came back and ran it for 20 years after that, upon the death of my mom. So this restaurant's been in the family for many, many years. And it sounds like you advanced through all the different roles there. Am I correct in that assumption? Yes. So you really know what it's like to run a business, don't you? I do. So you've got a lot of practical experience as opposed to just simply the academic experience, huh? Lots, lots of practical experience. Uh-huh. Drew? Yeah, Maureen, you mentioned in the green room that um, your, your parents really focused on customer service. How do they demonstrate that? Well, we recognized uh, very early on that the customer paid our family bills, paid for our education, paid for our family needs. And so uh, we were required to uh, attend to every customer immediately, whether in person or we had a home phone that, that rang from the restaurant. If it didn't ring, it, uh, it didn't get picked up in three times. We had to pick it up as a, as a kid and service the customer. So anything that it took, what the was customer... The what was a lesson to be learned uh, during that experience? Uh, the lesson to be learned was, um, you know, hard work, uh, service, service to the customer, um, making sure that they were um, taken care of appropriately. Mm -hmm. Shannon? Maureen, do you ever have a chance to hear from your previous students? So I hear from my previous students all the time. Um, I grew up in, in that restaurant community and community is important to me. Uh, so I stay connected. They come back. Uh, they share their experiences. They, they conduct workshops. They talk to younger students. They inspire them. And what does it mean to you to hear their stories after they've taken your class and out in the real world having some success? I love to hear their stories. I love to hear what they're doing. I'm very proud of their accomplishments. Um, I encourage them to try new things and to keep it going. Mm -hmm. Matthew? Maureen, it's pretty clear to me that your parents buying this restaurant at 11 was a, was a big deal in your life. I'm curious, why'd they do it? Where'd it come from? <laughs> so my parents were, uh, were children of immigrants. Uh, they believed in, uh, you know, the American dream. And from early on, my dad had a passion to own a restaurant. Uh, he came out of the Navy. He had a regular job selling insurance. Um, and my mom had a gift shop before I was born. So I, it was in their blood. My dad continued to look for one. You said before, you said earlier, your dad was a dreamer. Tell me a little bit about that. So he had a dream to own a restaurant and uh, he didn't have the means to do it, but he had the dream to do it. So early on, we went out and looked at restaurants. Uh, we, we sat in there, we did due diligence. He took me with him. Uh, we talked and to owners. 
And, and how are you a dreamer today? I have the vision and I can set vision. I can see it moving forward. And then I can uh, use the operational experience that I had um, and gain through experience, but through my mom, who was really the operations person, the tough person to be able to execute on that. Mm-hmm. Frank? So Maureen, you spent a lot of time in the family restaurants, but I sense that you didn't think of it as a job, rather you embraced it as a way of life. Is that accurate? Yes, it was a way of life. I mean, literally, we grew up in a commercial kitchen with all the characters that come in, um, all of the vendors. So, so talk about the characters. You indicated that you had some pretty unique discussions, pretty deep discussions with some of the employees. Can you talk about that? Sure. Interviewing employees, um, what, what, they, what were they good at? What were their skills? What did they want to do? How, what could how, they how do? How young were you when you started interviewing the uh, employees at the, uh, at the uh, restaurant? I would say 11. So you were 11. Why would you do that? Why, why are you having these deep conversations at 11? I had a need to learn how to do things and to how to, how to make them grow. And I learned from my dad. In those days, we didn't have the internet. You had to talk to people. So uh, that, a, that's, that sounds like entrepreneurial thinking back then. Is that what you teach students that are scientists today? It's exactly what I teach them. And I encourage them to learn that way too. It's a, today is a different world, right? Uh, but in those days, you learn by talking with people and, and learning what makes them tick. Mm-hmm. Drew, what else are you thinking? I was just curious. You, you know, you mentioned there was sort of a struggle when you, you, your parents first bought uh, this restaurant. What did that feel like to you? It was a, a big responsibility. I felt personal responsibility to contribute, to work, to work hard, to work in the restaurant. Um, and I, that, that responsibility stayed with me through my life. Uh, responsibility to the restaurant itself, to the business, to the family. <laughs> And how about when you're teaching them? I mean, I'm imagining that's a big part, like you're going to struggle, you know, starting a business. Is that a, is that a part of what you're teaching these kids? It's a big part of it. Uh, you know, kids come in with a lot of ideas and really getting them to move off of that idea phase, to take action, to take that risk, to not be afraid, to give it a try, uh, really requires some pushing and some mentoring and uh, some guidance. And And quite honestly, a little bit of hands off and let them fail, so to speak, or, you know, it's a safe environment, but let them. Maureen, why are you doing this? Why why don't you go retire? (laughs) I don't know. I love it. I just love watching startups. I love watching people grow. I love to see them build things. um, And I love to be a part of it. Hmm. You feel like you're really helping them grow and tell me more about that. What do you mean? Uh, I think from being a little bit gritty and scrappy, I was able at a young age to figure out what people, um, what their skills were and what they liked and how they could use those. And so I think today with college students and kids, that's um, a mentor's role is to take that under undeveloped uh, potential that they might have. They not, they don't even know of and, and really bring that out. Let them be able to do things that they never imagined. So you were, as you were interviewing these adults, when you were a kid, you weren't trying to figure out what was wrong with them. You were trying to figure out where you could use them. It's the same thing you're doing with these (laughs) students. You were trying to figure out how, where, what these students strengths are. You're like a career coach. Sort of. I would say a mentor. Yeah. I, I think one of the strengths is to be able to get people to do what they never imagined they could do. Ah, there's the you imagine, right? You imagine uh-huh. center. So you're, you really want to help people go beyond what they think, what they may be able to do. You really want to help them identify where their strengths are, as well as help them attract all their ideas. Right. Do you put, do you put people together? I do. So uh, once they get that idea and they're trying to move forward, I try and connect them up with people that can help them, can give them advice, can give them guidance, can give them information, um, can, mm. can guide them along the way. Mm. And you really enjoy this. This, is, uh, this really turns you on. This really is, uh, this is exciting to you, isn't it? It is. I like to go with them. Sometimes they like to go off by themselves. I feel like a parent, you know, tagging along a little bit, but uh, uh-huh. I do enjoy the conversation. Uh-huh. And um, what, what, time do you, what time do you get started to work in the morning? What time do you, what time do you get on the email in the morning? What time do you start? I start emails around seven, but, you know, coming from the restaurant business, I am a late night person. Uh, so what so, time do you stop at night? 
Uh, sometimes it's 12, sometimes it's one. With COVID, it's been a little uh, later. You, you get paid extra for doing that? <laughs> no. no. What's the uh, website address for this organization known as the Imagine Center at uh, Ursinus College? Ursinus.edu slash Imagine. Let me have that one more time. Ursinus.edu backslash Imagine. We've been speaking with Maureen uh, Cumstone, who's the entrepreneur in residence at Imagine Center at Ursinus College. Don't forget to visit our website. It's executiveleadersradio.com. That's executiveleadersradio.com. Learn more about our executive leaders. We'll be back in a moment right after this break. Don't go away. You now can recognize your deserving business advisors on our nation's leading business with heart radio show, executiveleadersradio.com. Yes, recognize you can recognize your deserving business advisors on our nation's leading business with heart radio show, executiveleadersradio.com. Simply visit executiveleadersradio.com, securely enter their info, and we'll reach out to spotlight your deserving business advisors on our nation's leading business with heart radio show, executiveleadersradio.com. Don't wait. This radio and online social media and search engine exposure is quite valuable to your advisors. Yes, this radio and online social media exposure is free and quite valuable to your business advisors who deserve to be recognized. Visit executiveleadersradio.com now to nominate your deserving business advisors. back. You're listening to Executive Leaders Radio. This is your host, Herb Cohen. We'd like to introduce Michael Aiello, CEO and Managing Partner of Century Business Consulting. Michael, what is Century Business Consulting? What are you guys doing? Yeah, sure. We're, we're CPAs, but we're not your traditional CPAs. We don't do audits. We don't do taxes. Instead, we focus on helping companies with their growth goals and meeting their compliance. So whether that's with M&A or IPOs, whether it's with compliance and SEC reporting and Sarbanes-Oxley, or whether it's outsourced accounting, valuing your business, helping you come up with what you want to do next in your business plan. Um, How did you get a job with this company? sounds pretty sophisticated. Yeah, I actually started the company uh, back in 2011. It was me, myself, and I. So you started the business. 70 people. Uh Where are you from originally? I'm from a working-class neighborhood in Philadelphia. Uh huh. How many brothers and sisters? Where are you in the pecking order? I am the oldest of four. Mm hmm. And eight to fourteen. What were you? What was the primary thing you were up to? Was it play? Was it? Uh, didn't you start? Did you tell us we were making money at nine or ten or something. Yeah, absolutely. I, I've always had the entrepreneurial spirit. I think it started with uh, paper routes at at nine years old, picking up my first one, growing it to take on a second one, uh, and continuing to progress and take on more opportunity. So you were the kid who just didn't, it wasn't one, one, it wasn't one paper route. You had to go get a second. So your game is to keep building and building and building more and more and more. Am I right about that? Absolutely. Uh Uh-huh. Okay. Just trying to get the personality trait here at the age of nine with the second newspaper route. Frank, he's all yours. Michael. So you grew up in a blue collar neighborhood. You're in a very competitive business. My guess is you played some sports growing up. I did. I did. I played ice hockey, lacrosse, and uh, football, basketball, you name it. So what was your favorite sport? I'd say ice hockey was my favorite sport. Why ice hockey? Yeah, uh, ice hockey was something I, I you know, I grew up uh, playing more street hockey. By the time I got to high school, it gave me an opportunity to become a leader and, and build a team. Uh, it was a new sport to the high school I was at. So what was the personality trait that you brought to that team? You know, I think it was hunger, leadership, drive, and and never saying a stop till the, the buzzer rang. And so what did popular sports teach you, and how did that help shape you? It, it taught me how to be a team player, to take on the role that I needed to be in each situation. It taught me hunger. It taught me humility. And it, it taught me to never say I can't do something. I can't do more. And what do you bring from sports into the business environment today? Yeah, I think it's absolutely a team environment at, at Century where, where I, I am uh, the CEO and building a team environment where everyone has a different role on the team. Matthew? 
Yeah, Michael, you said you played a lot of hockey, and I think you said in the green room before lacrosse also in an inner city school. So you were playing against suburban schools, I assume, a lot, right? Yeah, we played against a lot of more mature suburban schools who had these teams for, for years. So definitely learned a lot of humility. We lost a lot of games big. Well, why would you go and join the sports that were new and were losing all the time? Why didn't you go and join a sport that won? Yeah, again, a, a theme of my life, I guess, you know, never, never taking the easy route, looking to build and grow something. And being part of a new team and helping progress that was extremely appealing to me. To tell us the part about the goal you scored for the lacrosse team. Yeah, so fu funny story. I scored the first ever uh, goal in lacrosse history for Roman in the second season. So uh, that translates to no goals the entire first year. Well, um, tell me why you find it more satisfying to score the first goal in the second season of a sport than to win. Again, it was building something. It was progress. It was being part of something that was starting and growing. And, and now to this day, the, the Roman Catholic uh, teams for lacrosse and ice hockey now win championships and everything else. And I was part of the beginning. Shailen? Michael, I'm curious. What was your mom like when you were a kid? Yeah, my, my parents had me early and, and you know, uh, definitely a working class environment and pushed me to always do more, to educate myself, to grow and to be a, a role model for my younger siblings. Um, so not only was I a leader to them, I, I was a leader to the family in a lot of ways. And my mom pushed me to, to go to college and do things that were different than what was the, the typical in my neighborhood or family environment. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned in the green room that your mom was also able to lead by example. Um, tell us more about that. Yeah, you know, I think my mom, you know, never, never took, uh, uh, never feared a challenge, always took on what was next to build the family environment, to be able to do what it took to, to feed the family, to work on the house, to build something, to progress us to push us from, you know, a house next to the train tracks to further up the hill and forward. And my mom was the major driving component to our family progressing. How does that relate to the way you're building your team nowadays? Again, continuing to progress, build, and, and look for opportunities to grow. Um, you know, it, where we start isn't where we finish in this world. And that is something I learned from my mom and also pushing me, you know, nothing was ever good enough, and I mean that in a positive way. True. My family environment. And my God, was just how you went from sort of a tough, blue-collar neighborhood where your family was really into construction and using their hands to build things to high-end business consulting. Yeah, sure. So, you know, started off with those paper routes, moved into doing construction and stucco and cement work, onto painting, and uh, found an individual who I was painting his home, his rental properties, his office, and I, he seemed to have built a nice living and a nice business. And I said, you know, what, what the heck do you do? And he said, I'm a CPA. I said, so you do taxes? He said, not really. I help companies grow. I help them build their business model and take their companies to the next level. And that was extremely appealing. That happened at 16 or 17. From there, I decided that was my calling and went to college to not just do traditional accounting services, but to help businesses grow. Wow. And how about, can you tell us about him? He seemed to inspire and teach you a lot. Yeah. His name is Mr. Applebaum. And, uh, you know, he came from humble beginnings, pulled himself up and was able to grow a business, build a certain level of wealth, be able to take care of his family, put his children through college and all those things. And that was something that I, I aspired to have one day. Well, what was the lesson there? Uh, a lesson learned is, you know, that if you work hard, if you put in the time, there's nothing you can't do in this world. And, and that really start, I started with the entrepreneurial spirit again there for me. Mm -hmm. Wasn't your uh, grandfather in business? He was. He, he started a construction business and, uh, you know, always showed me that what was important was hard work and quality. And that's what the, the, the business was and is known for, providing a quality product. Did you ever work in that business? I did. I worked very, very closely. You know, I was taught that I needed to work hard, work fast, and do it with a smile. Mm -hmm. So what, how young were you when you were working in your grandfather's business, and what were you doing? Uh, 
shoot from from the, the probably five or six, but definitely in my teens, a, a significant amount carrying cement, shoveling stone, uh, ripping down walls, whatever it took. I, I was a laborer and I was doing anything I could to help, but I was also studying. I was listening. I was watching what customer service looked like and, and learned a lot from that as well. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, is your grandfather still around? He is passed. Mm-hmm. If he was still around looking down, how do you think he'd feel about what you're doing nowadays? I think he'd be extremely proud to see what, what, I, what I've helped build with, with my firm, what I've built with my family, and that that started with him and that DNA of being an entrepreneur, being a business person, and knowing that that's not a nine-to-five job, as I saw him doing the books well, and records at night or whatever what's it What's interesting is you spoke about um, what we built with the business. You didn't say what, how I've built the business, even though you're the founder sounds like you're giving everybody else a lot of credit there. Am I correct about that? Absolutely. We would not be where we are today without my partners, without my colleagues, and we are absolutely a team. Hmm. So it really is the team. It's not just you. I mean, you may help drive it forward. So you have a, what's your role in the team in the, in the business? It, it's certainly evolved over the years, but today I'm, I'm the CEO. I'm the visionary. I need to come up with our, our next product mix our next opportunities and drive the firm forward. Mm-hmm. What's the and website? Ad- what's the website address for this organization known as Century Business Consulting? It's centuryconsulting.com. And that's C E N T R I consulting.com. We've been speaking with Michael Aiello, CEO and managing partner of Century Business Consulting here on Executive Leaders Radio. Don't uh, don't leave us. We'll be back in a moment right after this break. Back, you're listening to Executive Leaders Radio. This is your host, Herb Cohen, and we'd like to introduce Carol Ben Maimon, President and CEO of Laramar Therapeutics. Carol, what is Laramar Therapeutics? What are you guys doing? We're a pharmaceutical company that develops drugs for rare diseases. Um, we actually have our lead program in the clinic right now in a disease called Friedrich's ataxia, which is a rare genetic disease where pa- children are actually born appearing healthy. They're wheelchair bound by their tw- in their twenties, and they die in their thirties and forties. A really devastating disease. Wow, where are you from originally? At, right outside of Philadelphia, a suburb of Philadelphia. And how many brothers and sisters? And where are you in the pecking order? I'm the oldest, and I have one brother. Mm-hmm. And uh, how young were you when you started making money? And what were you doing? And where? I was about 13, and I was working at a fish store where I was catching fish and selling aquariums. Mm-hmm. How long did you work there for? About two years. Mm-hmm. And how'd you like working there? I loved working there. What'd you like about working at this aquarium store? I loved that it was sort of down and dirty. I loved being part of a team. I loved doing it myself. Mm-hmm. Did you have any interest in the animals that were there and the science that was there? Yeah, I did. I always loved animals, and I I loved the fish. They're kind of cool with all the different colors, and you know, how do they 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 look like they're painted at night. Uh huh. Were you trying to figure out how to take care of the animals as opposed to just selling them? I was. I used to clean the tanks and feed them. You used to clean the tanks. Who taught you how to clean the tanks? Probably another fish catcher. Did you find a better way of doing it? I don't think I really found a better way of doing it. Uh huh. All really. right. Drew? Yeah, you mentioned uh, in the green room you played tennis growing up. How did you get into tennis? My father started me in tennis from the time I was like three or four. Well, why did he do that? He always felt that sports were important. He felt that being active was important. And uh, did your dad show up when you were competing playing tennis? Always. And what did that mean to you to look over and always know your dad was there? My dad was just a really amazing mentor. He always taught my brother and I that we needed to do whatever we could to be successful um, and to keep moving forward. And how has your dad inspired what you're doing today? Um, my father was a very hardworking person. He was a, always wanted us to have a professional career. Me as the oldest and the only girl, 
He encouraged me to make the best career I could and to make sure I could be independent mm. and take care of myself. Mm. Let me hear your dad telling you when you're faced with a tough decision at the office. Well, that you got to bounce. You got to do whatever you think you need to do. It's better to make a decision than not to do not to make a decision because make not making a decision is often making a decision. Mm -hmm. Matthew, I'm curious, Carol. How young were you when you started on the path to being a doctor? I decided I wanted to be a doctor when I was 12. What made you make that decision? I always liked being part of a team, and I always liked taking care of people. <laughs> Who were you taking care of at that point? Well, I always took care of my little brother. Um, okay. That that was always the case. And and so I guess you saw a lot of women doctors around that you wanted to emulate. Is that what was going on? There actually weren't a lot of women doctors when I went to school. Um, so, actually, I think there were only nine women in my whole class, my whole medical school class. So where did you get the strength to do that? What made you believe you could be a doctor? From my dad. My dad always encouraged me to be a doctor. My father fought in World War II in France and Germany and always felt that we needed to have a profession that we could practice anywhere in the world because you never knew what was going to happen in the world. Was there a woman along the path who was a, a, a role model or a mentor to you? My mom. My mom was a housekeeper in the beginning. She, my father didn't want her to work. So she started painting and doing artwork. And when I was 12, she actually went back full time to the Academy of Fine Arts and became a full time student. Hmm. Um, let's see, Shannon. Carol, between what you're doing at the office every day and then also in the green room, we spoke about um, the nonprofit board that you sit on. I'm just curious where this idea of giving back came from and how young you were. I, I always wanted to give back, and my father always gave back to the community wherever he could. Um, you know, the the board I sit on is a hospital that's in an underserved community, which really doesn't have a lot of health care options. And it's really a pleasure to be part of something that is so – people that are so committed to making sure that the underserved communities of Philadelphia um, have access to affordable health care. Mm -hmm. How was your dad able to show you the importance of giving back when you were a kid? He was always volunteering his time. He was always involved in community events. He was always involved in, 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 contrib in contributing both time and money wherever he could to make, it, to make a difference for people. Mm -hmm. Frank? So, Carol, you became a doctor. How long did you practice? Only for a couple of years. I, actually, so, I did do a residency and fellowship. And then I came okay. Out. And when did you switch from being a medical practitioner to a medical executive? When I had my first child. What caused that? What was the reason? Well, I was in a very traditional marriage. I was ha wanted to have a family. And work-life balance was a, was a real challenge. And my husband really didn't like my beeper. And I actually loved science. And so I made the switch. Um, and I never looked back. Are you still able to help people the way you were as a practitioner? I think I actually probably have helped more people because with every drug you get to market that's actually successful, especially in, in diseases where there are no alternatives and there are real unmet medical needs, you probably affect more people than you can affect putting your hands on a patient. And running your business today, do you challenge and encourage your team the way your father did for you? Yep, and I'm part of that team. Um, we started with four people, and in three and a half years now, we're up to 21 people. Um, we took something from literally an academic center, and now we're in clinical trials. Um, and it's all a team. We couldn't do it without every single person um, on the team. Mm -hmm. Carol, am I, am I correct in assuming that you like starting stuff and you like beginnings? I do. Uh -huh. And I, every, every company that I've gone to, I start with one or two or three people on my team, and I grow it. And once it gets big, I usually leave and go to something small. Wait a minute. So you're a serial entrepreneur? I'm a, I'm a serial team builder and developer, I think. How young were you when you started building teams or developing things or starting things? Give me an example how young. I probably, when I was even part of the tennis team, you know, when you're in a, in a sport, especially in a sport that is often individual, it's, it's challenging sometimes to, to make it into a team. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's probably when it started. But I've always enjoyed community. I enjoy, and, and my work is part of my community. I'm totally passionate about the patients. You know, what we do is so important. Mm 
Mm -hmm. Matthew? You've talked a lot, Carol, actually about fixing things too. How young were you when you were fixing things and what is fixing things role in your life? Well, being a doctor, you fix things, right? <laughs> so, you know, that started, that's how I, I look at it. You know, in, in, in medicine, it's not, it's not terribly rewarding if you can't fix it. Because you started off talking about watching your father fixing trucks, and I was actually struck by the, by yes. the comparison. It's all fixing. So my father is a, was a trucker that ran a garage, and um, I used to go down to the garage, and he would be under a hood fixing a truck, and I used to ask him, how did you ever figure out how to fix a truck? He went to law school, and he said, I grew up with it. I started at 12 years old in his father's business, my grandfather's business. And had been around trucks all his life. Mm hmm So you're a lot like your father. You got this fixing thing from your dad, only not trucks, it's people. Am I correct? Yep. People are important. And patients are really important. Uh-huh. And patients are really important. So do you develop, um, have you developed personal relationships with some of your patients over the years? So I did when I was a doctor, but when you're in, in drug development, you have to be very careful not to know patients personally because we're doing clinical trials on them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But we get emails because this is such a rare and devastating disease. We actually got an email a couple of years ago when we first started from a woman whose six-year-old daughter had just been diagnosed. And she sent along a picture of her daughter. And she asked us to please put it on the wall of our lab so that we would always remember that there really were patients behind these, these diseases and that wow. we were having a direct impact. So her daughter's picture is actually on our lab wall. Wow. Talking about making an impact. Um, what's the best part of your day? Best part of my, being around my, my, my employees and my peers Good and my team. team. What's the website address for your organization known as Laramar Therapeutics? LaramarTX.com. Let me have that one more time. LaramarTX.com. We've been speaking with Carol Ben Maiman, President and CEO of Laramar Therapeutics here on Executive Leaders Radio. Don't forget to visit our website, executiveleadersradio.com, to learn more about our executive leaders. It's executiveleadersradio.com. Stick around. We'll be back right after this quick break. Recognize your deserving business advisors on our nation's leading business with heart radio show, Executive Leaders Radio. Yes, recognize you can recognize your deserving business advisors on our nation's leading business with heart radio show, Executive Leaders Radio dot com. Simply visit Executive Leaders Radio dot com, securely enter their info, and we'll reach out to spotlight your deserving business advisors on our nation's leading business with heart radio show, Executive Leaders Radio. Radio.com. Don't wait. This radio and online social media and search engine exposure is quite valuable. Yes, this radio and online social media and search engine exposure is quite valuable. To your business advisors who deserve to be recognized, visit executiveleadersradio.com now to nominate your deserving business advisors for free exposure. back. You're listening to Executive Leaders Radio. This is your host, Herb Cohen, and we'd like to introduce David Cole, President and CEO of Science History Institute. David, what is the Science History Institute? Science History Institute is a museum and a library in the heart of Old Town, Philadelphia. And uh, unlike science centers and museums, uh, we're really focused on telling the history of science. Hmm, the history of science. How many visitors visit your site or your facility each year? We have close to 100,000 who visit the facility each year and over a million more who are our good friends online. Wow. Where you're from originally and how many brothers and sisters and where are you in the pecking order? Yeah, I uh, grew up in a sleepy suburb of St. Louis called Webster Groves, Missouri, and I am the oldest of three boys. The oldest of three. And uh, Matthew. David, tell us what you were doing from 8 to 14. Yeah, I was uh, doing a lot of reading at home. I uh, grew up in a house with a lot of books. And, uh, and to make some money, I was mowing a lot of lawns and, uh, and then working uh, at an amusement park to make a few bucks. 
and an amusement park. Tell me a little bit about the amusement park. Yeah, I worked at a place called Six Flags over Mid-America, big amusement park outside of St. Louis. And uh, my first job was uh, working in the fried, the outdoor fried chicken shack uh, in the middle of a sounds, hot St. Louis summer. <laughs> that sounds like a great job. Was it fun? Were you good at frying the chicken? You know, it wasn't that fun, and I was lousy at frying chicken. Uh, tell tell I, me I did, about that. Yeah, well, I, I went into it thinking, oh, frying chicken, anybody can do that, right? And what I figured out was that, you know, sorting and breading and preparing chicken and frying it up uh, in the in a St. Louis summer is actually, there's more to it than meets the eye. I wasn't terribly good at it. So how long did you last? About two weeks doing that before they moved me out to, to run some of the rides. Oh, wow. So were you better at running the rides? I was. I was a little better at, at, at running the rides, getting people on and off the rides than I was at breading chicken. And so what have you learned that you bring with you to work today from, from your, I think you said before six weeks, because I like that six weeks. Of yeah, six flags. sure. I think about it all the time today. I think about the fact that I went into that first job thinking, you know, how hard th- can this be? How complicated can frying chicken be? And what I learned is, you know, never take for granted, never assume that someone's job is easy. It's probably more compli- more complicated than you think it is. And you said when you were younger, you were also swimming a little bit on a swim team. Tell us about that. Yeah, I swam a lot in the summer times competitively, uh, 13, 14 year old, pretty big kid for my age. And so they put me up against the, the kids who were a lot older and I swam for my life. <laughs> tell, tell me more. Yeah, well, I, uh, you know, they, they, they had me competing against kids who were a lot older and, and I didn't have a lot of confidence there. So every time I got in the pool, I just swam uh, so that I f- afraid that I'd lose. And that turned about to be a pretty good strategy to win many times. And I'm also curious, that means your teammates were probably older than you too, right? They were in most cases, yeah. But I, you know, I felt like uh, for that reason, to, to, I had to give a double effort to make sure that I was accepted as one of the team. How, how did you learn how to do, how did you learn to give a double effort? How did you learn to get accepted by the team? Yeah, I think it was just, it started in practice, like most things start in practice, right? And it was about compartmentalizing everything else, setting other concerns aside, just being laser focused and showing that I took it as seriously or more seriously than anybody else. And so, you know, uh, give me more credit for than, than my years would have allowed necessarily. Drew? was my message. David, I just want to go back to being surrounded by books at home. Was there a particular book you remember reading and being inspired by? Yeah, I loved history from the beginning and was really inspired by a big book I had at home on the history of the U.S. presidents. And, and what inspired you about that book? Why were you interested in that? Well, it was more than a textbook. Uh, I like learning about history through characters, through people who did things in their life stories. And this was chock full of amazing life stories. And how does that book relate over to what you're doing today? Well, it's very similar. Um, you know, most of us learn about science at school through textbooks, through lectures, and that can be interesting, maybe sometimes boring, but when you tell the story of something like science through individual characters and their innovations and their trials and tribulations, that's drama. That's exciting. Hmm. Let's see, Mr. Frank, what kind of questions you got? So David, you're, you're obviously excited about science so much so that you want to educate others about it. How young were you when you were first introduced to science? Well, certainly in high school, in the traditional way in school, and that was good. I learned, you know, about the basics of it. But it was really in college that I started to see science, uh, how science could connect to history and how you could wrap a story around it. That's when the light bulb went on. And so the people who visit your institute, what do you hope they learn? or How do you hope to inspire them by teaching them the, about the history of science? What I hope they learn is that they come here, they learn about how we got to where we are today scientifically, and that they go outside the museum, look at the world around them and say, wow, there is science hidden in plain sight. It's all around us. I never realized how it got there. And now maybe I have a better sense of how it did. Mm -hmm. Shana? David, I'm curious, who was someone that you looked up to when you were a kid? Both my parents, for sure. Uh, Mom and dad. Yeah, absolutely. And why your dad? Dad, because he was a born entrepreneur. Um, Mom, because she's a born business builder, organizer, manager. What do you mean by that? Tell me a little bit more about your mom. 
My mom started out when I was young, started out as a traditional kind of homemaking role, but she eventually transitioned to become a nonprofit executive. And uh, she was successful because she had an amazing eye for detail. No task, no detail was too small. And what did you learn from your mom and her going through that um, and, you know, that transformation that you carry with you today? I mean, she's absolutely inspired me to be a nonprofit executive and in, in different fields. I think it's because she learned how on the fly to reimagine herself, to tell her story differently. Uh, and that was incredibly inspiring to me. Reimagining. So do you have to reimagine the this organization known as the Science History Institute or does it always stay the same? It has to be reimagined. We have to adjust to the world around us. I think that's true for any nonprofit organization. And every day we're rethinking how can we connect with audiences? How can we take our content and our stories and connect with audiences differently and in different places? Wait a minute. Connect with audiences. Tell me more about that. What are you talking about? Well, you know, I think that, that traditionally uh, uh, science is something that people experience in a textbook, maybe the science museum. But now, you know, where our audience is living, they're living online. They're all over the world. They're on different digital platforms. And it's our job to figure out where they are and meet them where they are with a great story. So the museum's physical, but you've also constructed an, an, a website which has, which is experiential? Absolutely. So sciencehistory.org, if you can't come to our place locally in Philadelphia, you know, we ask people to join us online and listen to podcasts, read articles, watch videos, lots of multimedia ways to experience the history of science online. Where's the money coming from to build this museum and support this organization? Well, we do a really good job. We're really, we're really aggressive and really active in trying to enlist a lot of partners, whether they're corporate, foundations, individual funders, to see the value of what we're doing, connecting people to the science in their lives, that that's a societal win if we do that. And all the big stakeholders out there with money to support us, um, we hope they see it that way too. Considering your organizational abilities and your people skills and your ability to convince people, why don't you go get a job making a lot of money in corporate America or something? You know, I started out as an economics major, and I enjoyed that. And I actually did work in the corporate world for a while as a strategy consultant. But I kept coming back to storytelling. It's, it's such fun to surprise people with facts about the world around them that they didn't know. And you do that through storytelling. And um, I couldn't think of a better way to do that than the kind of job I have now. Well, that's sort of like it, when you mentioned that, that thick book, A History of U.S. Presidents, that you were reading when you were a kid, you read it several times over. Yeah. It's like you really enjoy the gathering of knowledge and understanding the stories because we asked you, what did you really enjoy about those books about the U.S. presidents? And you said it was really understanding the people. What was that all about? It's understanding that the history isn't just a collection of, of bore, drying, or dry, boring facts. It's really people, their stories, and how people move the world around them. And mm -hmm. people love drama, right? We love characters. Gotcha. And uh, so we wrap it around that to make it compelling. Website address again of the Science History Institute. ScienceHistory.org. We've been speaking with David Cole, President and CEO of Science History Institute here on Executive Leaders Radio. Matthew, will you please give us the rundown? I'd love to. It's been a great show today, Herb. We started off with Maureen Cumston, the entrepreneur in residence at U the U Imagine Center at Ursinus College. Then we had Michael Aiello, the CEO and managing partner of Century Business Consulting. We had Carol Ben Maimon, the president and CEO of Laramar Therapeutics, and we just wrapped it up with David Cole, president and CEO of the Science History Institute. I would like to thank my co-hosts, including Drew Hanlon Hanlon, Frank Hennessy, Premier Planning, Matthew Shapiro, Obermeyer, and Shannon Lane, Newmark Knight Frank, for giving me a hand structuring the questions, hope for providing a listening audience an educational and entertaining show. I'd like to thank our listening audience for listening. Otherwise, we wouldn't have a radio show. Don't forget to visit our website, executiveleadersradio.com. To learn more about our executive leaders, thank you for joining us today and have a nice day. Bye bye.